When I was six, growing up in Siberia, I told my mother that I would like to become an artist. She said, wonderful. To be clear, it wasn't like, how was your day at the carnival? Wonderful. But more like, I spilled my coffee on white shirt. Wonderful. <laughs> you see, in my kindergarten, the artworks were arranged from best to last. And I was always second to the bottom. And so before my mother agreed to spend on my art education, she wanted to know, why do I want to be an artist? And so, without missing a beat and looking her straight in the eye, I said, I want to make the world a more beautiful place. Of course. And that is how I spent seven years getting to know the universal language of visual arts. And as I was getting better, seven years later, we immigrated to the United States. I was 13. I did not speak English. And you remember 13, right? Very few things are more traumatic than a combination of puberty and high school. <laughs> but at least everybody else had a chance to discuss how traumatic it was. I could not say a word. And instead, I was lost in my studies and discovered another universal language of math and science. And so I had a second career conversation with my mother, where I told her that I would like to become an engineer. My mother asked me why, and without missing a beat, I looked her straight in the eye and I said, to make a world a more functional place. <laughs> of course. Now, you have to understand, to my parents, who are both engineers, this was music to their ears. <laughs> my dad walked a little taller, and he was already a very tall guy. And my mom, smiled, it's like she finally did something right. <laughs> but that didn't last. I learned English. I developed opinions. I developed a sense of justice. And I wanted to make sure that I make an impact. I really earned to make a difference. So I had a third conversation with my mother, where I told her that I would like to become a lawyer. She didn't even ask why. <laughs> and the conversation very quickly escalated from mom to dad. So my dad sat me down, and he said, Olga, I got used to the idea of you making the world a more beautiful place. And then you had this idea of making the world a more functional place. And I thought that was a terrific idea. It sounds like you gave up on both. <laughs> but that was different. I actually went to law school, took the bar exam, became a tech lawyer, so take that, Dad. <laughs> I'm kidding. My dad has always been supportive. This is not the story I'm going to tell you. But he never stopped wondering how two engineers managed to raise one lawyer. <laughs> now, fast forward to today, and I think I finally have discovered that thing that will make a world a more beautiful and functional place. Smart contracts. And before I go tell you what they are and give you examples of their applications, let me talk a little bit about blockchain the underlying technology. Now, you may be wondering, what on earth is blockchain? And if you think about it for a minute, you may even imagine a movie starring somebody like the Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you know, blockchain. <laughs> the unfortunate name aside, it is really an immutable distributed ledger. Immutable means that if you put something on blockchain, 
it's really hard to change. It is pretty much there forever. Distributed means that no one computer can decide. It's a network of computers around the world sharing that decision. And ledger is just a table, like an Excel table that contains a lot of information. Now, what makes this technology work is cryptology, which is a magic ingredient. <laughs> when you mix it all up, that's what makes blockchain work. Now, this technology is no joke. It's a lot of math. But at the core, I think of blockchain as a history of all transactions. Now, using blockchain and technology platform like Ethereum, you can build decentralized applications, or dApps. And at the core of dApps are smart contracts. So that brings me to smart contracts. Let's talk about smart contracts. I hate to disappoint you, though. Smart contracts also have a misguiding name. They're not really smart, as in, this little girl is very smart. And they're not really contracts, as in, pages of pages of legalese where you sign at the bottom and date. Not that kind of contract. They're really pieces of code that codify business logic. And at the core, they facilitate three functions. One, they store rules. Two, they verify rules. And three, they self-execute rules. I tend to think of them as very secure vending machines. So, for example, every vending machine stores a rule that if you insert a dollar, you may get a snack of choice. And then when you go and insert, in fact, a dollar, it verifies the correct amount. And after verification, voila, a happy moment, you get a snack of choice. That is kind of how smart contracts work. And because they are blockchain application, there is no intermediary. There is no broker. There is no escrow agent. There is no government corporation, not even a lawyer. It executes automatically. So to summarize, smart contracts are pieces of code. They're very secure, and they self-execute. That's very exciting. And the world of business is in the process of embracing smart contracts. We'll see numerous applications in IoT, financial sector, supply chain, and numerous others. But the reason I get up in the morning and get really excited about smart contracts is because of their potential to solve problems that have never been solved before. Now, I'm going to go through four applications, and I will treat them separate. But in reality, any one smart contract can combine more than one application. I want to make sure that you really get a breadth and depth of what's possible. So application one, smart contracts are very good at storing data. So for example, there's an American startup that is rethinking census. And they're building a decentralized protocol using smart contracts. Census is a very powerful tool in the United States and many other nations. Census is how we determine how to distribute billions of federal dollars every year. Census is how we determine where we build bridges, schools, roads, hospitals. So census is very important. This startup collects questions from the people, then it collects answers from the people, and then it securely stores it all on blockchain and anonymously. So this way, our legislators can really get a representation of who we are as a people and what it is that we want. Smart contracts are very good at facilitating trust. So, for example, another startup, now a little bit more international, it includes people from Australia, 
Canada, and Germany, is connecting urban farmers, landowners, and consumers. It allows putting small lease agreements on blockchain using smart contracts and facilitate renting of small plots of land. And small plots of land add up to a big field. So for example, if I own a house in San Francisco and I don't have time or interest to garden, I can rent my backyard or if I have a flat roof, even a roof, for somebody to cultivate this. Now, the benefits of urban farming are huge. It allows to decrease our carbon footprint. It allows us to build tighter community. It's an opportunity to explain to our children where our food comes from. And most importantly, urban farming is beautiful and delicious. Now, number three, smart contracts can function as software libraries. And I know that sounds a little dry. Talking about software libraries is a little bit like me inviting you to watch the paint dry or watch the grass grow. It's, it's a little boring, I get it. But it actually has life-saving applications. So for example, in the United States, over 100,000 people are waiting for kidney transpla transplant every year. And on average, it takes three to five years. And in some states, it takes up to 10. And the real bummer is, is that the longer you wait, the less likely the transplant is successful. There is, of course, a solution to this. Many hospitals allow somebody in the patient's network to donate a kidney, like a friend, a family member, a co-worker, or just a kind stranger. But the challenge is, is that the donor is not always a match. There is a solution to that as well. Hospitals allow a swap. So for example, if a donor A is not a match with a patient A, and a donor B is not a match with a patient B, they can swap. The challenge is, this solution is highly geographically limited. So two women from Germany, Germany and France are creating a protocol that allows to match pair donations real time and across geographies. So not only does it solve the problem of time, it also allows for successful transplant operations. Application four, smart contracts are really good at authenticating. So for example, since 2015, a startup in Finland has been working with the government to give a prepaid card to every refugee and displaced person who enters that country. That card stores identity on blockchain. A refugee can now go into the bank and open a bank account, no passport, no ID is required. They can then quickly get government benefits so they can survive. But it gets even more interesting than this. Using smart contracts, they can borrow from their network, so not only can they survive, they actually can build credit and have a chance to thrive. What if we extend this solution to 70 million refugees who on average stay in their host country for over 10 years. You know, when we think of a better world, we don't usually think about blockchain. We don't think about smart contract. And it's partially because these technologies are not well understood. Of course, funny names, very complicated technology and lots of mess are not helpful either. <laughs> but I am convinced that once we realize that we can use smart contracts to solve long-standing problems, we will attract talent from all over the world and we'll be able to leverage the creativity and knowledge. Let me give you an example. 
There is a social network. It's a decentralized social network in New York for artists. No words, just pictures. And the amazing part is to watch those artists play with it, explore, make mistakes, collaborate, and ultimately make beautiful art. Yes, there is this part where they use the smart contracts to make sure that they're paid fairly, and that is absolutely important. But you know what is more interesting? 150,000 artists, 50 countries, creativity unleashed. New artworks that never been seen before. Collaboration, creativity, completely unleashed. Imagine if we could channel that creativity, that intelligence, to other disciplines, to solving world problems. I am convinced that the progress we've made from the beginnings of times up until information age would pale in comparison with what we can do with this technology. You see, when I was six and wanted to make a world a more beautiful place, I never heard of smart contracts. And when I was 16 and wanted to make a world a more functional place, I've never heard of smart contract either. And even when I went to law school and I wanted to make a world a more just place, never heard of smart contracts. But today, I am convinced that smart contracts have joined arts and sciences to make a difference and solve the world's biggest problems. Imagine a world where trust is given. Imagine a world where we can unleash creativity of this planet. Imagine a world where a census represents who we are, where urban farms are thriving, where kidney donations are seamless, and refugees get part to be, to be part of our world. Wouldn't that be a beautiful and functional world? Thank you. <laughs>